The ocean is surely a thing of beauty, powerful and very, very dangerous beauty. Some people even claim that surviving in the freezing vacuum of space might be more likely than escaping from the clutches of the ocean. But space is often called the final frontier for us humans. It's vast, dark, and probably filled with all kinds of terrors. You can't but expect some disaster at every turn, and we still don't know whether some hostile civilizations are lurking out there, waiting for us to come closer. But the ocean on our home planet is no less scary. It's vast and mostly unexplored. We don't know what kind of monsters might still be hiding in its extreme depths. And still, it has been romanticized much more than the cosmos. Unlike space, the ocean is something familiar. Only a few people have floated in zero gravity above the atmosphere of our planet, but lots of people have felt the ocean playing with their toes at least once in their lives. We also have some general idea of what to expect from it. Fish, scary looking fish, monster fish, and a lot of water. But experts claim that this assumption is terribly wrong. We have explored and mapped only 5% of the ocean. So can we really say that we know what's going on down there? It means that what actually lives in the remaining 95% of the ocean is unknown. Maybe there are some real-life monsters roaming the waters out there. We do know that some pretty creepy creatures live in the deepest places of the world's oceans, like the Mariana Trench. For example, look at this. This monster is known as the frilled shark. It looks like an overgrown eel and has gills lined with red fringe at the edges, hence the name. The creature's horrifying mouth is lined up with 25 rows of razor-sharp, backward-facing teeth. The shark hovers in the water, waiting to charge at its prey like a snake. Or this one, the deep-sea hatchetfish. It has a ridiculously skinny body and large tubular eyes pointing upward. The fish might look fragile. Even the largest specimens reach only six inches in length, but it can live at a depth of 5,000 feet. The hatchetfish can also regulate its glow depending on the amount of light around. That's how they camouflage. With its protruding, flattened snout and pink-colored skin, the goblin shark looks like a visitor from another planet. The creature's terrifying jaws are attached to elastic ligaments. When prey comes too close, the shark catapults its mouth forward to catch it. If your mouth could do the same, you would be able to eat things dangling pretty far away from your face. Or look at this thing. It's the ping pong tree sponge. It may look like a beautiful ethereal lamp, but its appearance is deceptive. This creature with a funny name is a dangerous carnivorous sponge living at the depths of nearly 9,000 feet. The soft looking balls are covered in minuscule hook shaped spikes. They trap careless sea inhabitants and consume them, which looks as if the prey simply melts away on the translucent globes. If these monsters are what we know about, what outlandish creatures might still be lurking there? The ocean is far from tamed. So let's admit it. Both Earth's oceans and outer space are terrifying in their own unique ways. But which one is scarier? What do marine biologists and astronomers have to tell us? Oh, the verdict might actually surprise you. Lots of scientists believe that the ocean is way scarier than space. They say they wouldn't turn their back on the ocean. There are many more ways the ocean can hurt you than the dangers you may encounter in space. From venomous animals to the pressure of the deep sea and a lack of oxygen. And what do you think? What is scarier, the ocean or outer space? In the past 30 years, scientists have made an incredible discovery of a new creature living deep beneath the surface of the ocean. And the name of the creature is the harp sponge. Now, if you're wondering why it took so long to come across this animal, then I might have the answer. These creatures typically hang out at a depth of roughly 11,100 feet beneath the ocean's waves. This sponge species was first discovered off the coast of California thanks to a robot that was sturdy enough to explore those crazy depths the ocean has to offer. This is no doubt an area of the planet where even the most benign-looking creatures can be potentially dangerous. But even scientists were surprised to find that this creature was more than just a sponge. Now, this might seem obvious, but the harp sponge got its name because its basic structure, referred to as a vein, is the same shape as a harp. 
Each vein is made up of a horizontal branch, supporting several parallel vertical branches. But don't let the harp sponge's fanciful and amusing appearance or its non-intimidating name fool you. Yeah, the harp sponge is very much a deep-sea hunter. It has a unique ability to capture and envelop small animals using its rhizoids, short, thin fibers. With their help, the harp sponge clings on to the soft, muddy bottom and catches tiny creatures that get swept into its branches by deep-sea currents. Uh-oh. Other sponge creatures often feed by pulling bacteria and bits of organic matter from the seawater and filtering them through their bodies. But not our harp sponge. Mm-mm. Instead, it snatches its future meal with minuscule barbed hooks that cover each of the harp sponge's branches. Now, harp sponges prefer tiny crustaceans, like crabs, crayfish, shrimps, and prawns. Once the harp sponge has one of them in its clutches, it envelops the animal in a thin membrane before slowly beginning to digest it. So, pal, what's eating you? Oh, harpo? Too bad. Researchers believe that harp sponges use this method of feeding because there aren't enough nutrients that deep down. This makes traditional filter feeding less effective. Research has shown that the creature is still in the process of evolving. Early harp sponges researchers found only had two veins. But later, scientists discovered other harp sponges that had six veins. The harp sponge might have evolved this elaborate candle holder-like structure to increase its surface area. In general, harp sponges typically grow up to a length of one foot. But researchers have seen a creature that was two feet in length. The harp sponge is not wow. only very unusual but also beautiful to look at. See those tiny white balls on top of the branches? Now, why don't we look at some other creatures that live below the photic zone of Earth's oceans? The photic zone means the area beneath the ocean's surface that still receives some sunlight. Thanks to this, there are loads of different creatures and organisms living there. Any animal living beyond this layer qualifies as a deep-sea creature. The Tomopterus worm is a segmented worm you can find in the twilight zone of the ocean. This is the area that lies between 650 and 3,300 feet beneath the surface. These creatures are often no more than one inch long, but the largest of them can grow up to one foot. While swimming around and feeding, these worms do what researchers describe as an amazing smooth dance. That's because the creatures can swim extremely quickly and maneuver at tight angles with ease. Now, I know most people hear the word worm and think of the common earthworm. So it's quite interesting to know there's a deep-sea worm out there that never leaves the water during its entire life. Similarly, most of us try to avoid jellyfish that either rest on the sand or sit on top of the ocean waves. This isn't the case with a crassota jelly. That's a deep-sea creature, too. This beautiful jellyfish is mostly ruby red, bright orange, or electric purple. That's what helped researchers realize they had found a new species of jellyfish. The creature grows to a maximum size of 1 inch across. It has tentacles that stretch out in every direction. Now, if you come close to this jellyfish, it'll pull all these tentacles in toward its body before rapidly swimming away to avoid danger. Yes, you are dangerous. The chrysota jelly is extremely rare. You won't see it very often. You might need to borrow that deep-sea diving robot I mentioned earlier. While worms and jellyfish might seem quite harmless, this isn't the case with the Pacific viperfish. Ooh. This creature is equipped with a noticeably big mouth, like me. And the needle-like teeth inside are key to its hunting strategy. Pacific viperfish live at around 5,000 feet below the ocean surface. But they're among those numerous marine animals that migrate each night from the ocean depths toward shallower waters to dine. What's on the menu for dinner tonight? Hmm, lots of small fish and shrimp. The creature can grow up to 12 inches in length. Its two front fangs, which stick up from the fish's bottom jaw past its own eyes, are especially dramatic. When the fish unhinges its jaw, its mouth can open wide enough to engulf smaller animals. And the teeth form a cage to prevent an escape. Now, have you ever seen an underwater creature that looks like a strawberry? Trust me, it does exist. Just look at these dots on the strawberry squid. The creature has a big eye and a smaller one. You might think this unconventional pairing would be awkward and uncomfortable, but it's actually the opposite. The big left eye looks upward. 
It spots shadows cast by other animals in the dimly lit waters above. The eye's tubular shape helps it collect as much light as possible. On the other side of the squid's head, you can see its right eye. It's small and looks downward. This eye searches for flashes of bioluminescence produced by animals lurking in the darker waters below. Now, bioluminescence means the production and emission of light by living organisms. By the way, the squid has a nickname. And no, it's not squiggy, although that's a great one. It's known as the cockeyed squid. This is simply due to the remarkable difference in size between its two eyes. Hmm, I think I like squiggy better. And so it goes. Since light doesn't reach the deep sea, the strawberry squid's body actually looks black. This helps the creature hide from enemies, such as sharks and dolphins. In general, the strawberry squid grows to a length of 5 inches. It typically lives around 3,000 feet below the surface, but floats to shallower waters at night. Now, the feather star is a marine creature without a backbone, but with feather-like arms that radiate from the center of its body. These creatures first appeared around 200 million years ago. Related to sea stars, they look like a flower, but if you approach them, they'll quickly swim away. But not all feather stars can swim. Many species can only crawl along the bottom of the seafloor. Like some of the other deep-sea creatures we've looked at, the feather star can adapt to its surroundings. It has a creepy ability to shed its arms, the same way some lizards can shed their tails. This also helps them escape from their enemies. Feather stars live all across the globe, from the equator to the poles, from the shallow waters on top of reefs to the deep, deep sea. Now, given that we're dealing with mysterious creatures, the name of this one is quite fitting. The swift vampire squid should be the official symbol of life in the deep sea. The animal has a dark red body, huge blue eyes, and a cloak-like web that stretches between its eight arms. This, along with its name, may suggest that the creature is some form of a terrifying hunter. In reality, though, the vampire squid is a soft-bodied, timid creature about the size, shape, and color of a football. It grows to roughly 12 inches in length and lives 3,000 feet below the waves. There's almost no oxygen there, but also relatively few predators. Whew, I think I'll need to decompress from this one. The universe is not static. It evolves all the time and grows in all directions. It's expanding, and scientists found this out almost a century ago. And it's not at a stable rate. The more time goes by, the faster the universe expands. As this happens, stars, planets, and galaxies move farther and farther apart, which leaves more space between them. If that's the case, the universe is supposed to become colder as it expands, right? After all, it was a lot denser when the Big Bang happened, and a lot hotter. As it was expanding, space was cooling down, which created conditions for planets, stars, and other space objects to form. Yeah, that's not exactly the case now. Scientists were surprised to hear it too. But our universe is actually getting hotter. They observed the temperature of cosmic gas farther away from our home planet compared to young gases closer to the Earth. Since we measure distance in space by light years, farther areas are like going back to the past, and regions closer to us are like observing the present day. They found out the temperature of a gas in space has gone up more than 10 times in the last 10 billion years. Now, the temperature of the cosmic gas that's spread all across the universe can get to around 4 million degrees Fahrenheit. Wow! As the universe expands, gravitational force does its part and pulls gas and dark matter together. It's doing some pretty hard work there. It creates galaxies and clusters of galaxies out of them. And this process is totally chaotic. It's so messy that more and more gas heats up as all of this is happening. Space was extremely hot when it was just forming, 13.7 billion years ago. What if it gets warm like that once again? Scientists are observing the situation. They found out the temperature in space increased by measuring cosmic gases using something called redshift. They generally use this method when they want to see how far away some space objects are. Those that are closer to us have shorter light wavelengths. The farther some object is, the longer its light wavelengths are. And they can now determine the temperature of a certain object from its light. On average, space is a pretty cold place. 
The glow that's left from the Big Bang is called the CMB, which is short for the Cosmic Microwave Background. It's so powerful and intense, it bathes the entire universe in light. It's the only thing that significantly heats up matter. But there are many smaller mechanisms that help to heat up matter in the universe, and they could go crazy if space warms up. Like stars, they emit radiation that affects nearby dust and gas. They radiate throughout the far infrared too. When a star is at its early stage, the radiation coming from it forms protoplanetary structures that look like disks. They primarily form in a single plane, and a bright central star produces spectacularly illuminated gas, and there are blue reflections of this gas. It was like that with our planetary system too. Strong energy and gravitational forces cause collisions, dust, and gas in an uncontrolled vortex that's forming planets. That's why most planets in our solar system orbit in the same direction. That's the direction this giant whirlpool was spinning a long time ago, too. Active stars, colliding galaxies, stellar cataclysms, black holes, neutron stars. The universe has so many sources of energy. And when you surround normal matter in space with such an energetic environment, it heats up drastically. When you heat something up, it radiates that energy away in a certain way. In most cases, galaxies have just a couple of areas where stars are forming, at regions where gas is collapsing. A bubble that surrounds that area contains ionized hydrogen. Three quarters of our sun is hydrogen. Thanks to that hydrogen, the sun keeps us warm. In its core, hydrogen transforms into helium and causes atomic fusion. Yep, that's how our sun releases its energy. Radiation heats all that gas to thousands and thousands of degrees. At the same time, it ionizes a large number of atoms and molecules, which basically means it turns them into ions. Atoms are neutral particles, and ions are either negatively or positively charged particles. If the universe heats up, our sun might too. If its temperature hits 30,000 degrees Kelvin, it could become hot enough to ionize all those materials it had previously ejected and it could create a real planetary nebula. This would be a nebula in the shape of a ring that forms because of an expanding gas that surrounds an aging star. As the temperature goes up all the time, hydrogen ionizes. At a few thousand degrees, this could turn the nebulae in our solar system pink with emission lines. Our sun could come to its end if it reaches the temperature of 50,000 degrees Kelvin. If you could float in space and come closer, you'd see it glow in eerie green tones because of doubly ionized oxygen. Higher energy phenomena make more galaxies collide. This heats gas even more and eventually results in X-ray emissions. What about black holes and radiating neutron stars? When they go crazy, they can shape whole galaxies and who knows what more. Maybe we'd have more masers too. Those are natural lasers our universe produces. They arise when big populations of molecules receive large amounts of energy. By now, scientists have found the strongest, yet the most distant, maser. So powerful, it's more luminous than the light 6,000 suns would produce, and in just one emission line. Maybe then we'd discover even stronger masers. That's in the case that we're even going to be here at all. Because as the universe is getting hotter, cosmic radiation is getting stronger not so good for life on Earth. Increased cosmic radiation could harm us. Who knows if life would even be possible on Earth in that case, or if the powerful gravitational force would pull our home planet too and crash it into another one. But maybe life as we know it wouldn't completely disappear. Or if that happened, it could possibly somehow find its way once again, maybe in the distant future. There's a possibility our universe could support life at its early stages doesn't look like that when you think of the chaos the Big Bang caused, right? But that was only in its mere beginnings. After things had settled down a bit, the dregs of enormous, earliest stars formed rocky planets. In our solar system, those are Earth, Mars, Mercury, and Venus. You can't set your foot on the rest of them since they're gas giants. Back in that time, radiation was quite intense, so rocky planets had an adequate environment to form since it takes a lot of energy to whirlpool dust and particles and bake a planet in the end. 
This period of time coincides roughly with that when the first stars formed in our universe. Ancient stars were way bigger than our sun. They lived shorter though. They would have just exploded as supernovas on their end, and they would leave heavy metals across the space around them. Those are the particles rocky planets form from. Radiation spread around the whole universe back then. It has changed over time. Today, it's almost an absolute zero. 400,000 years after the Big Bang, when hydrogen atoms were forming, CMB was almost as hot as the surface of our sun. And about 15 million years after the Big Bang, its temperature was close to room temperature, which is around 80 degrees Fahrenheit. These things were happening across the universe, so there were many planets that could potentially hold life. If we were one of those ancient worlds, we wouldn't need a star to keep us warm. CMB would be enough to do it. So, it's possible that life in space is way older than we think it is. There could have been ancient worlds with liquid water on their surface. What if there were some primitive forms of organisms, like on our home planet a long time ago? Or even more developed ones? Perhaps we'll find out one day.